them up here in my backyard. Thinking of making some more videos and I'm into a lightning storm. I may just end them up sitting in my pickup. Talk to you uh, more about this Council of the Gods theme. This this theme is a, uh, a huge theme. There's the uh, windmills. They're, they're turning a little bit. What a beautiful day, though. Looks like I've got some storm clouds. Just saw some lightning a minute ago. Kind of interesting. Well, I'm going to uh, I'm going to share some more of Michael Heiser's doctoral dissertation with you on the uh, Council of the Gods in the Dead Sea Scrolls. Now, last weekend I discussed the uh, the serious implications using Fletcher Lewis on the deification of mankind found in the Dead Sea Scrolls. And now I'm going to share Michael Heiser's themes of the Council of the Gods in the Dead Sea Scrolls and share with you why these Dead Sea Scrolls are some of the grandest, some of the best documentations for Joseph Smith and the restoration that I have ever discovered for myself. There's uh, multitudinous themes in the Dead Sea Scrolls that just jive really, really well with Mormonism. And it's awfully fun to uh, to share those with you. Oh, I wouldn't want to be those guys out on a motorcycle this time of day, huh? You gonna get wet, boys? <laughs> Michael Heiser has done an exceptional doctoral dissertation back in 2004, just a few years back. Woo! There was a good bowl of lightning. I hope I got that on video. Where he discusses the... Uh, Council of the Gods in the Dead Sea Scrolls. There's over 175 occurrences of the Council of the Gods mentioned in the Dead Sea Scrolls. And I think that's utterly fascinating that it is that prominent of a theme in the uh, scrolls. And it's certainly a prominent theme in the ancient Near Eastern pantheons and all of the various nations, as William F. Albright has noted, all of the various nations have this Council of the Gods themes. Yeah, I drove right up into this storm. Hope I don't get struck by lightning. That would suck. Well, it's a raining, gentlemen and ladies. Woo, here it comes. Yeah, I love the rain. Beautiful. Turn around here and see if I can get back out of this cloud. I'm in the middle of a cloud burst here. Yeah, lightning and thunder all over. Woohoo! What a time to video, huh? You're right in the middle of it. This is one night of whole summer rainstorms like. Right now, Michael Heiser in his doctoral dissertation. The uh, name of this, you can find him on the internet, and, and I've mentioned him several times before. The Divine Council in Late Canonical and Non-Canonical Second Temple Jewish Literature. Uh, really a good doctoral dissertation. And of course there's areas where I disagree with him. Just because I'm touting him doesn't mean I accept everything he writes. Uh, he has done an inc incredibly good job using the Hebrew on... Well, the terms for the Council of the Gods, the Adat El, and the, uh, the Assembly, the Sod, the Secret, the Council, so on and so forth. And his analysis of the Dead Sea Scrolls concepts of the Council of the Gods, does that help, is extremely well done. Very good, in fact. Uh, some, of the, some of the best analysis I've ever seen done on the... Uh, on the Dead Sea Scrolls in relation to this Council of the Gods. And he notes, now I've numbered this, it didn't come numbered, uh, the pages, so I'm in chapter 7, for those of you who have this dissertation. It's the uh, Divine Council in Qumran Sectarian Literature, and I've got it numbered as page 167, my numbering. So if I'm off a little bit, I, I'm in chapter 7, you'll be able to find where I'm at. The... Uh, the Qumran community's religious world view now was in concert with the monolatrist religion 
of pre-exilic Israel. He, he says the religion was not monotheism, and it wasn't polytheism, it was monolatrous. It recognized that other deities existed, but the worldview of ancient Israel was that they worshipped only Yahweh. But other gods were in existence, and the, in fact, following his analysis, his expert analysis of Deuteronomy 32, the other nations were allotted to the other gods, and Yahweh, of course, received Israel. And this is how Deuteronomy 32 sets up this world view. So this is monolatrous religion, according to Heiser. He says, this worldview included a divine council composed in part of the plural Elohim, and the Bene Elim, that is, the sons of the gods, and a divine vice-regent, with the belief that a council hierarchy of divine beings exercised geographical and political control over the Gentile nations. And these nations were set up in opposition to Yahweh and his inheritance of Israel. This is the worldview of the ancient Near East, and it, it has now been discovered in our Hebrew Bible. So it's fascinating. He says there is no mention, and he discusses once again, the confusion of terminology that has been occurring because scholars refuse to recognize the Hebrew word Elohim means God, and in some contexts, Elohim can mean gods, plural. There's no question about this. Hebrew has a perfectly legitimate word for angels, malak, malakim, the angels. They are never used synonymously, however, the Elohim and the Malachim. They are separate. When the texts discuss the Bene Elohim, they are talking about the sons of gods, not human judges, not human rulers, and not angels. They're talking about the first tier of the council, that is, the gods. And this is so interesting how Heiser demonstrates this, and, and it's in his other chapter. I was just so impressed with the, the analysis that he has on the Council of the Gods in the Dead Sea Scrolls. He says, there is no mention of the Council of the Angels. There is no Malachim mentioned as a council in the Dead Sea Scrolls sectarian Qumran literature. The terms Elohim and Malachim are never clearly used as synonyms either. Qumran materials contain numerous references to the Divine Council and its Elohim in precisely the same language. Now this is interesting because the Dead Sea Scrolls use the exact same language as the Hebrew text and in the context of pre-exilic texts in the Hebrew Bible. So this is critical to understand. The existence of both terms in the Hebrew Bible's pre-exilic text in no way indicates that they refer to the same beings. They do not. These terms are separate. Gods are separate from the angels in the Qumran materials in this Council of the Gods. Now, the angels could be attendants in the Council, but they are not the gods. The sons of the god, as Mark Smith notes, and as Heiser acknowledged in his earlier part of his thesis, the sons of God, the Bene Elohim and the Bene Elim, they are part of the Council because they're part of the family of the god. They are literally his sons. Yahweh, in the, the Canaanitish and the, uh, the Rosh, Shamra, Ugaritic texts, Yahweh was the son of Elohim. He was one of the sons. Now, of El. There, El had 70 sons in the Ugaritic pantheon. And, and the uh, scholars have discussed this in extensive. Uh, Ulf Oldenburg and uh, Frank Moore Cross and... Uh, E. Theodore Mullen Jr., and now Michael Heiser. Several scholars have discussed this theme of these sons of God in the Council of the Gods, and it's very interesting. It's awful dark today. I'm up here in the middle of the mountains, and I'm getting rained out. I, I suppose I could stand out in the rain and get soaked just to show you my sincere dedication to sharing information with you. <laughs> yeah, you'd like that, wouldn't you? Forget it. No chance, man. The passages uh, of the council language speak of second-tier deities akin or similar to the Canaanite Divine Assembly. And that's what it's called, the Canaanite Divine Assembly also. 
And he says how Carol Newsom and several other scholars have this assumption of a monotheistic bias when translating these texts, and they try very hard to equate the angels with the gods, the Elohim, and it just doesn't work.